there are many different strange things that happening in this series. First day is always the hardest. Why do people find the type system so fascinating? I kind of stopped encouraging people beyond basics. Most people are learning uh, by making mistakes and then finding about them on uh, code review, on uh, production, <laughs> hopefully not, but sometimes, and on uh, unit tests. And I'm doing exactly the same. And it, of course, uh, make me uh, dislike what I presented before. Does this help you on your everyday journey as a Kotlin developer, you know, dive deeper into the language to leverage it better for your own use cases. And you also unlock other uh, use cases that seemed magical uh, before. Finding the balance between those two is the, is the art of making idiomatic Kotlin code. The reason I don't do Android development is because I read that book. The topic with Kotlin uh, is, um, I mean, nearly closed. Welcome to another episode of uh, Talking Kotlin, Seb. everybody. Yeah. What the hell? What's what's up? What happened to your to to my to my beard? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I it was it was Halloween a couple of days ago, or at least our Halloween party. So I decided I'd commit. So you decided to, to look bit. scary, huh? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> what's scarier than a clean-shaven Sebi? Uh, if you don't know what Hadi's talking about, you should tune in on YouTube.com/slash Kotlin. Um, but also greetings to our audio listeners. Uh, yeah. yeah, I keep forgetting that we have audio listeners still. Why are you are not you? on YouTube? They should all be on YouTube. Like, you could totally drive and and um, no, you couldn't, could you? No, never mind. Hey, how are you Uber. anyway, Seb? Yeah. How are I'm, you? I'm good. I'm good. What did you go or what are you going as, as uh, for this Halloween, Hadi? I don't go as Halloween. You don't go as Halloween. I don't go as Halloween. You know what I'm going at? I'm going out. I'm I'm going as an idiot because my 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 one of my kids has kicked me out of the house today because uh, he wants to have a Halloween party. So okay, that's what I'm going at as an idiot. All right, yeah, exactly. sounds like you're gonna have some fun time cleaning tomorrow. That's excellent. No way. No, I told no. him. I said, you see, I I come home tomorrow and there's a single stain or a single mess. It's over. <laughs> He's done. He's done. It's like I, right. I, 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 yeah, no, no, it's not gonna happen. Famous last words. Anyway, yeah. indeed. All right. So, who's our guest today? Today we're talking to uh, Marcin. Marcin Moscala, who's the founder of KT Academy, um, who's also a Google developer uh, expert for Kotlin. Uh, you might know him for uh, as a book author, and he's also a guy who does trainings for people in all things Kotlin. Welcome to the show, Marcin. Hello, Sebastian. Hello, Hadi. Hi. Um, and also, folks, he also has a beard. Yes, he, I still do. You still yeah. do. Yeah, but Sebastian inspired me, so who knows what will happen next. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Let, let, let me be the one that's clean shaven every day, okay? Well, not every day, but for the show. Is is this the thing that sets you apart from us? Exactly. That and okay. my good looks and my old age and my gray hair and... Uh, oh, God, now you got me all depressed about how old I am. <laughs> you see what you do? <laughs> Let's cheer you up by talking a little bit about some some actual Kotlin stuff. Huh? That always gets yeah, everyone excited, that. right? Yes, yes. All right. So, Marcin, you you teach people Kotlin in all kinds of different ways, right? Like, you, as we've said, you're you're doing like workshops, you're writing books. How did how did all of that actually start for you? It started like many stories from. Um, frustration from using Java as an Android developer. Whoa, I think it was over five years ago, certainly, probably more than that. Um, it was still, uh, Kotlin was still in beta and I used uh, Kotlin and I, I loved it. For me, it was a recipe for my Java frustrations. So I decided that I need to work on that. That was funny years. Kotlin was still a hipster thing. And um, I uh, was so fascinated about it. So I started writing articles. Uh, I started appearing on conferences. 
and I published my first book. I'm not very proud of uh, Android uh, development with Kotlin. Uh, that's the worst of my book, so please do not do not buy it. I am finally trying to make it right. So uh, the series I'm writing right now is uh, is my attempt to to finally um, make it right and make the uh, uh, Kotlin knowledge well organized and in a good form, uh, presented in a good form. Um, but back then it was a you know huge thing for me. I became a book author. I started appearing on conferences. And then it was actually JetBrains who, who, who first introduced me to uh, teaching Kotlin uh, because they, they um, introduced me to the, the client that asked them for a, uh, for a Kotlin training. And uh, I'm very happy that I started this path. So for the record, um, you said you're not proud of your book about Kotlin for Android, right? And I just want to set the record here that the reason I don't do Android development is because I read that book and <laughs> I'm just, I agree with you. You shouldn't be proud. I'm joking. <laughs> Why were yeah. you not proud of that book? I mean, I, I just grew a lot from, from this time and uh, I, I see a lot of things that could be explained in a better uh, way. Um, you see, um, I actually think that book should be the, the, the final project of um, not only years of experience, because experience in Kotlin is one thing, but experience in teaching Kotlin is a certain, it's, it's a different thing, to totally different thing. Um, the workshop about Kotlin uh, on, uh, that takes three days, sometimes two days, uh, sometimes one day. Mm. Recently, I calculated that I conducted uh, nearly hundred times. <laughs> so um, over all that times, I was uh, with every iteration, I was changing it a little bit, improving it. Uh, I, I was, I, I could find a better and better ways to explain those uh, topics and uh, uh, better and better uh, examples. And it of course uh, make me uh, dislike what I presented before, um, and uh, yeah, it took a lot of time until it became stable enough enough for me to to make a book out of that. So, was it more about the way that you taught it, or that you understood Kotlin better, or or could we even say more idiomatic Kotlin? Did you become more idiomatic, or was it? Are you saying it's a combination of all of that? I think it's a combination of of all of that, but you know, it's a. Um, there are many topics that you might understand as a, or think you understand as a user, but but then you know when you 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 finally learn about something that totally changes your perspective. I, I think a great example is a type system in Kotlin that people learning Kotlin as a practitioners often learn about you know LB how how you can use return or throw on the right side of LB operator. Uh, how you can use return or throw um, in what, in an if else condition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it looks for to them like you know just a collection of use cases. But when when they start learning about type systems, they discover that it is not a collection of use cases. It is all a result of a consistent type system. So it builds. I mean, from the practitioner point of view, you know that's not a such a big difference but from the understanding point of view everything changes when you start having a big picture of how it all works together and i guess in in this case the uh, the big picture where things here fit together is the fact that the kotlin's type system doesn't just have a top type it also has a bottom type which is something that people are not exactly which is what people are not used to which is this this idea of nothing and the idea of return being an expression and not a statement that well in itself has this value again right um but yeah obviously these are these little things where i think people can get away with not knowing them uh for a long time but once you once these kind of little puzzle pieces click together uh you kind of unlock this next level like this this power up would you agree Exactly. And you also unlock other uh, use cases that seemed magical uh, before, like this uh, popular pattern with um, uh, type with nothing, 
type argument, you know, like an empty list. Uh, the, the type of empty list in Kotlin uh, is a list of nothing. And it works beca because um, list is uh, contra uh, covariant and, and nothing is a subtype of, of all the types. So it is really hard to understand that without knowing those, those, those puzzles uh, that, that, that make this uh, possible. And, you know, it, it is not so easy to learn these kind of things um, by just practice. Uh, those are things that we are learning in, in books, in, in workshops, uh, sometimes in discussions with others. I always used to say to people that it's nothing to worry about, but apparently <laughs> it is. Um, and that joke is very, very old. So you, Isep mentions that you unlock uh, a whole new thing, right? So give us an example of what do you unlock? Like how does this help you on your everyday journey as a Kotlin developer, you know, dive deeper into the language to leverage it better for your own use cases? Hmm. It is really hard to move back in time to, to think how you could see things before you understood, understood something. Um, but um, I can just say that with deeper understanding of Kotlin, one can make a better, nicer style that is just, you know, that just looks good and uh, is not having surprises that that is um, no that's the, that's the problem with in I, I believe the majority of Kotlin developers uh, are ex Java developers who started using Kotlin not all of them but the majority I think um, and uh, they haven't have never received any formal education on that and uh, as a result they um, often um, do things that um, uh, on one way might be like a Java things adapted to Kotlin, what is you know far from being idiomatic. And on the other, uh, on the other way, um, use um, some Kotlin features in a, in a way that is um, sometimes tricky and dangerous. I, I show plenty of examples in the, in the Effective Kotlin book <clears throat> or in the current series. So when when you say that haven't received any formal training, are you referring to those that came from Java didn't really receive any formal training for Kotlin, or what? What do you mean? Because that's that's a very I big mean, bucket you've put a whole bunch of people in. Yes, I mean the formal training. I mean at least a, a good book explaining uh, Kotlin. I think, uh, for instance, Kotlin in Action is a is a really good book and. Uh, Careful, would, oh. careful, careful what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I know it's, um, it's um, modified right now and I'm waiting to read the second edition. I've read the, the first edition, um, but, uh, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good book and I treat it as a kind of a formal education. It helps to go, go beyond the, the use cases that are just observed <clears throat> with no deep thought in a regular project. Mm. Or other courses, there is a there is a great course on Coursera that is also made by Andre and by Stefana. Uh, or my books and my courses, that's another option. Yeah, I th I think it's uh, oftentimes I can very much uh, identify with the things you're saying because I I like trying new things, but that's usually you know you have a use case in mind and then you just kind of barrel towards that use case and you try to solve whatever problem it is you're having. And you kind of see the things that you have to learn to get there as like obstacles, like right? checkbox that you need to get through to get to your target. And I've always found that spending at least a little bit of time just sitting down with documentation of like the language as a whole, for example, or like diving deeper into individual topics, even though I can't apply them right then and there, uh, always helped me because you can only use the tools that you kind of know and understand a little bit deeper. Otherwise, you're always going to fall back to looking for something that looks similar to what you already know. That's a, that's a very common problem, uh, that people do things that to a certain degree work, um, but they do not understand how it um, works in non-typical use cases. Um, 
it is especially problematic in coroutines. I, I see it pretty often. So, um, for instance, people are willing to uh, protect some coroutine from uh, cancellation when one of its children is cancelled, make it um, use a, a job as an uh, argument to this coroutine. That's a very common uh, mistake. But when they do that, they do not know they introduce a memory leak because such a coroutine will not be cancelled when they are parent is the, when the scope is cancelled because they are not a children of this scope anymore. So um, it's not easy to find it out because you can, you know, you, you would need to know what to look for to find out what's wrong with that. And to a person who understands how relationship between coroutines are uh, built and uh, it's, it's obvious that uh, this uh, uh, pattern uh, changes the behavior of cancellation. And uh, it, uh, it, it is just clear that this is this is uh, problematic. Uh, but for a person who just wants to solve a, 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 a problem, they you know they, they did that. They solved their problem. They did not, they do not know they introduced a different problem. And there are many many other you know potential traps, uh, places where you uh, do something to solve some problem, but you do not know you are introducing another uh, problem. And this is this is where where trainings are helpful. So how would you say do people usually progress? Because I think, I mean, Kotlin is a, is a pretty vast ecosystem. There's a lot of things to learn um, for people to start with. I I guess oftentimes people, they, they start just writing a little bit of basic code. Um, but but from from there, like, where do you usually see people like branching towards? Do you do you have specific topics that give people grief when they when they first interact with Kotlin? Yeah, uh, I think the um, power of Kotlin is that it uh, allows um, Kotlin uh, Java developers, of course, not only Java, but but this mainly directed to to Java developers to benefit from Kotlin very quickly. So they can uh, introduce um, Kotlin in their project. Their uh, their code does not need to change too much, uh, and they already benefit from things like. Uh, uh, properties, so implicit uh, getters and setters uh, from a data modifier, from all the uh, small um, improvements that Kotlin introduced that, that, that Java do not have. Um, then they uh, start using Kotlin tools, um, tools like um, DSLs, uh, thing, things like, um, uh, let's say, property delegation. Um, but you know, uh, they often do not understand it too deeply. They are they are just just using it. I, I can see that because it's pretty uh, surprising to people when I start explaining how it actually works. And people are good users of those uh, tools. They they often do not understand how those uh, tools uh, work. What is a huge uh, difference? And I think this is where many people kind of stop. You know, uh, they. They learned to use things to a degree that they needed. They they rarely want to learn learn uh, much more much deeper than that because you know uh, probably they would benefit from it, but uh, there is no uh, specific thing that they they need at the moment that 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 uh, would help them uh, with the specific problem. So how do you encourage folks to do that? Because that's a problem. That's not only just Kotlin. IntelliJ idea, anything, any tool you use, right? Like I use keyboard shortcuts all the time and idea, and yet I still piss around with the mouse when I'm using Gmail, right? Even though I know that there are keyboard shortcuts. How do you encourage people to say, hey, actually, you should take the time and learn X, Y, or Z? <laughs> Regarding um, outside of my workshops, I kind of stopped encouraging people because um, what <laughs> like interests me most people. is, um, <laughs> I mean, what interests me most is showing people options, showing um, people best practices. This is what my articles, books are uh, mainly about. I mean, I used to be a person who was firing people. Hey, let's use Kotlin. It's amazing. I know there are many other people who are great in that, and uh, I, I, I concentrated on on uh, teaching. Uh, my own uh, my own topics. Uh, also, I uh, already have a, a nice number of workshops. 
I um, do not need to do any forms of promotions uh, beyond beyond what is um, my area of interest. I love writing books, so I'm writing them for people and I publish chapters from this book um, and um, they, they promote my workshops. So that's that's enough. I'm, I'm very happy because I'm doing what I love and um, I also can uh, live with, uh, from from that. Um, regarding my uh, workshops and my workshops, uh, what I uh, love doing is showing people some code snippets um, with surprising behavior and asking them, um, how is it going to work? How is it going to behave? Uh, and people often say H, and then I explain to them that the answer is uh, B, what uh, surprises them. I think this gives a lot of motivation uh, for uh, learning why it's different. I think it pretty well emulates a typical uh, case how people are learning, you know? Mm, be beyond basics, most people are learning uh, by making mistakes and then finding about them on uh, code review, on uh, production, <laughs> hopefully not, but sometimes, and on uh, unit tests. And I'm doing exactly the same. I show them a, a, a code, how is it going to work? They guess one thing. And then I'm explaining them, hey, sorry, it's, it's not the answer. Uh, if this would be your code, you would you know, release a, a mistake. So this is, this is the answer. This is how it behaves. And I think this, this makes people think a lot. I, I in general, uh, like teaching by examples. Like most, uh, most of my teaching is not a pure explanation. I'm doing a lot of live coding. I'm uh, showing code. I'm showing... Um, I'm showing, I'm writing code, I'm showing how it behaves, I'm making modifications, I also interact with people, and uh, I, I find it as a very um, effective way of teaching. Demanding from my side, but, but effective. So then would you say that people going for like workshops are just like naturally like more inclined towards diving deeper into the topics, like they already have this kind of motivation? Because I guess there's, as as you said beforehand, there's there's definitely people who are who are comfortable who are, who who can achieve the things they need to achieve right now with what they got, and then I guess there's the other group that just wants to dive deeper. Is is that kind of who you're targeting more? Yes, I often have a mix um, because um, the uh, if I organize an open workshop, I typically have a group of people who want to learn. That's amazing, but. The majority of my workshops are corporate workshops and uh, there is often <laughs> one or two people who wanted this workshop to happen. They organize it very often. Uh, there is a uh, one or two septics who, who think they know everything and they do not need to learn anything new. Uh, and there is a bunch of people who, um, you know, wouldn't come to this for workshop if it wouldn't be for free for them. And uh, they just needed to sign to a list and they have you know, three or two days, <laughs> they do not need to work, they can spend on learning. So this is my uh, typical group. And uh, what is my um, goal? I mean, the first day is always the hardest because I need to cover the basics um, because, you know, <laughs> those who have less knowledge needs to, you know, have basics. Uh, but I also need to address those septics to show them, hey, yeah, some things that you thought you understood, you you misunderstood. So the first day is always this mix of you know basics and also some um, uh, interesting um, uh, cases that 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 changes the perspective. Uh, I finish mm, the first day of my regular workshop of my regular Kotlin workshop with this type system section that is. Uh, that is very convincing for uh, for the septics pretty pretty often because they they, they rarely understand it well and uh, uh, they uh, it, it it is really convincing that they they did not know everything. Why do people find the type system so fascinating? What is the selling point or what is the thing that excites them the most? I think that um, the amazing part of this one is that. Um, People knew some specific, people had some specific observations of how things uh, work, but they were missing a, a big picture. And um, when I show, show to them, hey, this and this and this and this that you thought have nothing to do with each other, they actually 
plays on exactly the same mechanism. So the possibility to use return on throw on the right side of many things, the um, the the fact that um, after the error function or throw or return or, or to do function, you do not uh, need to use any other return or and the rest of the code is, is unreachable. This is a, a simple thing, but uh, the realization that it is uh, originating in the common in one simple and common mechanism, I think this is kind of mind blowing. Um, I, I think it is like um, you are watching a, a series um, like Lost or Adventure Time, and there are many different strange things that happening in this series. And then someone, I mean, someone gives you an official explanation that every all those strange things that you could observe, they actually makes perfect sense. And this is a, an amazing experience, I, I believe. Do you think that I'm I'm very interested because of course I'm sure like your workshops are a, a great resource of learning but do you have any um like ideas or suggestions for people who are more based on like uh or on self study beyond books do you feel that for example third party tools like linters or or some kind of you know tooling like this can also help you improve the way that you write Kotlin by, I don't know, showing you patterns you haven't seen before, this kind of stuff? Um, I think there are many great um, ways to learn Kotlin by uh, yourself. I mentioned a bunch of uh, books already. There are also a bunch of courses. Some of them are are uh, free. So people can learn uh, Kotlin well uh, by themselves. Um, regarding uh, learning Kotlin um, beyond the, the typical usage. Um, I think interactions with others are very helpful. Um, we are learning as a community uh, things, um, you know, a lot of knowledge is exchanged in, exchanged in uh, code reviews. Um, I think linters might be useful, but I'm not sure if they are such a good learning resource. I mean, they might be useful to, to force you to do things well, and maybe even uh, their explanations might be uh, useful uh, sometimes, but um, I don't think they give you a deep understanding that is that is um, truly uh, useful in, in long run. Well, I don't think anything does, right? I mean, you could say the same about IntelliJ IDEA, um, whether it's Java or whether it's Kotlin or whatever, you can, you know, you have a sec you have a fragment of code and it suggests to you hey you can convert this into another way of expressing it right and people sometimes just hit alt enter and they do that without further trying to understand the why uh, it's it's then up to them to figure out we actually we even used to have a entry in resharper uh which was why is resharper suggesting this and that used to link to a web page that would give you a detailed explanation of why this is happening. I think we have that in Rider as well. Um, not a lot of people read it, surprisingly, or should I say unsurprisingly. They're just like, oh, yeah, this looks cooler. Let me just do it. So, yeah, the same for linters, right? I, I think it is amazing when, when those tools uh, encourage people to dive into why, and this, this could be really helpful then. I, I think that pretty often people just apply those suggestions without too much thought. Yeah, but I think this is that's a, a tale as old as software engineering itself is people come up with patterns and all of a sudden people slap the patterns onto everything without understanding it. People come up with principles or concepts and they just apply it without thinking about it. They come up with new project management strategies and everyone just uses them. That's actually a big problem because every good principle uh, taken to extreme uh, is problematic, you know? Um, my um, ex uh, boss used to uh, say that with every principle there is a there is this star, you know. Like, of course, mm, we should avoid redundancy. Of course, we should redun uh, avoid redundancy. That is that is terrible. But in some cases, for instance, when we had uh, microservices, of course, we should avoid redundancy. But it also often means you need to create another microservice to that is the source of truth and uh, that introduces a, a latency, an additional latency. 
and uh, uh, probably some other problems. And uh, often the, the cost of that um, is uh, much, much bigger than just repeating um, the configuration in a bunch of places. So of course, you know, repeating is, is problematic, but you, when you understand why redundancy is problematic, you can finally um, calculate the costs of, of, of applying and not applying the, 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 the best practice. And this is where, where people uh, move from um, uh, mid developers into <laughs> into senior developers, I believe. Understanding that terms and conditions apply uh, with everything. <laughs> of course, so, yeah. So, since you started learning Kotlin, which was you said about five years ago, right? Had official release in two thousand sixteen, February, if I if I remember right. I think I was using Kotlin for at least a year by then. So uh, yeah, it's more year, more than five years. So have you yeah. figured out what idiomatic Kotlin is? Uh, you mean the presentation or? Um... I mean, do you know what idiomatic Kotlin means? Like if someone, if you see a code base and they say, and you're like, oh, this is not idiomatic Kotlin. Do, yeah, can you so do that now? <laughs> idiomatic Kotlin is um, like, um, like a you know holy grail we are looking for uh, for for years already mm, i'm not sure where the um, uh, word or the term originated but i remember uh, the presentation by uh, dimitri yemerov if i remember right i don't think it's well recorded but there is some poor recording on youtube that you can find and i think it was the the first, or at least the first that I know, um, public, um, you know, uh, attempt to to describe what uh, idiomatic Kotlin uh, means and uh, how to uh, achieve it. Uh, of course, this is n there is no. It's like with clean code, there is no uh, yes no uh, question, and there is no single definition. But I I I, I think I, I can um, guide people to. To, to move uh, towards more idiomatic uh, Kotlin, towards making their code more idiomatic Kotlin. Yeah, I mean, idiomatic originates from idioms, right? Which we have those in, in, in any natural language as well. Uh, but then again, it's, it, you know, if you can think of the English language, let's assume that there's a governing body that comes up with all the idioms, and the Spanish language also has the same, the Kotlin language, who comes up with all the idioms, right? I mean, right now it's it's the same as the code style. Right now we have a bunch of uh, idioms on the Kotlin Lang website, which I guess most of them have come up from the team. And uh, so is that idiomatic Kotlin? So that's that's the funny thing because uh, there is no one body for deciding on what are English idioms, English languages. I know, exactly, made by there people. Isn't. they just come and, about. Yeah, and there is exactly the same with, with developers. So um, I, I thought about it mm, a lot. So um, I thought about the, the clean code, uh, what, what a clean code is. That's a similar question in, in a way. So uh, I believe that uh, clean code, uh, I mean, what, what is the closest to the clean code uh, is what can be defined as the uh, simplest to understand by um, an average developer who is about to, to read it, you know? Who is that average developer? We don't know. Uh, we can just uh, predict, you know? There is a number of developers who might be working on this, this project, people that might be hired by your company. It's, um, it's up to you to predict uh, who they will be and based on that, uh, make your code. That, that makes a lot of difference, you know, because the uh, if you design code to be read, to be worked on by non-Kotlin developers, you will write it differently than when you know that those will be experienced Kotlin developers. I, I hope you, you see the point. Like, um, if else is cross-language, it's uh, preferred by JavaScript developers or by, by managers who do not know Kotlin so, so much. Kotlin uses a lot of idioms like uh, let, uh, also, apply, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that's, that's, one, that's one part of the answer. Um, another problem with idiomatic Kotlin is that um, there, are, there is a, actually a list of idioms on the um, Kotlin uh, documentation, yeah, the Kotlin idioms. 
Um, one of the idioms that is very popular in Kotlin is to use let, safe call let, to unpack nullable values. Yeah, that's a popular idiom in Kotlin. But if you would talk, discuss it with a person with functional programming background, I'm pretty sure that this person would tell you that this idiom is incorrect because they will tell you that let is a transformation function because it is an analog to a map for a single object and it should be a pure function. And that person would suggest you to use uh, also instead of let. The idiom stays the same, but function is different. So now we have a discussion. There is a group of people who, who, who say that this idiom should be implemented using also function because this, you know, because of all the theory that, that, that we have, <laughs> that we develop as a, as a programming community. And there is another group of people uh, who are uh, saying that we should use let instead because we've been using let for years and people just got used to that. Uh, who is right? I think both Neither. groups are right. <laughs> Neither, neither, track, yeah. Because um, sorry, but I mean, I think they're both really badly named. But hey, maybe that's just me, uh, or I don't know. Maybe I just don't get it. I never understood yeah, so, that. So what is idiomatic? I think is um, uh, not universal. It's a consequence of uh, who do we work with? Who do we expect this code to be uh, used by? Mm, it's somewhere between, you know, using Kotlin idioms the most um, efficient way um, because certainly in many cases using let uh, improves uh, our code um, because it introduces a nicer uh, patterns but also um, in uh, making our code as readable as possible and you know finding the balance between those two is the is the art of making idiomatic Kotlin code i have one one question that's specific to you because you are uh, an educator and you're you're teaching people and you're creating materials for the community to learn things right which is you also need to have learning materials that you read or you know you you also need to get these kind of information from somewhere so my question would be can you walk us through how you learn Kotlin nowadays? Not how you learned it five years ago, but how you stay up to date, how you try out new things. Do you discuss them with people? How does that work for you? Um, yes, discussions are uh, certainly included. Um, I mean, um, the, the topic with Kotlin uh, is, um, I mean, nearly closed. Kotlin does not change a lot. Of course, I'm reading every uh, uh, changelog that uh, you also publish, and uh, I am uh, checking those things by myself. I like to experiment with things, so I do not just accept a description. I, uh, when I see something, I often has, have hundreds of thoughts of how it might work and how it might be used incorrectly so i'm i'm, I'm playing with that i'm experimenting with that I, I i often make a lot of those small snippets to experiment with uh with uh, with things i also like um seeing the implementations of things not 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 always it is so easy but Kotlin is actually um amazing the, the amazing thing of Kotlin is that many things can be just read through, like flow. Flow is an extremely simple concept. Um, I mean, if you compare flow to RxJava, there is like no comparison. You can you can understand how flow works completely. It's a, it's a really relatively simple simple thing. I even published an, an article that um, kind of implements flow step by step in a in a sim sim simple article. Then you just add coroutines, you add channels, and you have pretty everything that you need for a flow. Implementing a map or filter in a flow is like five lines of code, very, very simple code. So <clears throat> many, many things I like to uh, read uh, through to check out um, uh, their implementations once they are uh, released and experiment with them. Um, and that's, uh, that's what I mainly do uh, with Kotlin. 
And of course, uh, discussions. I love um, code review uh, discussions. I uh, like talking with people about what should we do, what should we not do, what's, what's the problem. And in some occasions, conferences, but also on my, on my workshops, I uh, often uh, have discussions with, with, with people. I always, last, uh, I always ask them to, to show me some, um, uh, some strange use cases they, they have, and um, we discuss them through what is <clears throat> often pushing uh, not only their, but also sometimes mine uh, understanding of, of, of some topics. Uh, regarding uh, new things like, um, I don't know, uh, what, what I've been learning uh, new from Kotlin site, it's not so, so much um, because recently I've been um, researching different topics. I've been recent researching um, Jetpack Compose uh, recently. I uh, did not have too much chance to work with that because I have spent um, majority of my time on backend in recent years. Um, but yes, I've been, I've been researching that a bit and, uh, it is, um, if I, if I do not have enough occasions on my company, on the company I, I work for, it is typic typically, uh, making some, uh, projects to experiment with things, to, 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 to write some, um, to write some code, to, to dive deeply into how it works and, um, and yeah, that's that's the main way to learn about things for me. Do you kind of, when you say you you do experiments and you, and you try things out, are these usually like the typical clean room thing where you just you open a new project and you write a little bit of code and you see how it behaves, or do you have like some side projects that you're working on or or some some personal stuff uh, where you're tinkering and you're you know you're always throwing in the the unstable kind of stuff to see how it all like fits together. I have a bunch of side projects that I'm uh, where I'm using the most modern things, like in the KT Academy website on the backend. I'm I'm using uh, coroutines uh, for years already, um, but I also have uh, these small side projects I'm I'm, I'm developing. I uh, rarely uh, publish them um, because uh, you know. Finishing something to the degree that it is ready for others is certainly a different thing than doing something for myself. But I'm doing plenty of, of, of things. I'm doing small applications for, for myself and my colleagues. Recently, I've been learning uh, uh, about uh, quick learning in a course. So I've made a bunch of applications for the exercises they made there, like you know, remembering numbers or, or uh, counting the, the, the number of numbers from a bunch of... Uh, random um, uh, dices. Uh, I also sometimes do a small projects by, uh, for myself. Uh, there is a project I, um, I, I think it might not be stable right now, but um, I'm learning things using uh, flashcards in an, applications, in an application called Anki. Um, and uh, at, at one point I, I wanted to uh, connect uh, notes with flashcards. So I uh, invented uh, my own uh, markdown flavor for um, making uh, cards for, for, for these flashcards uh, thing. And um, I initially implemented that in Java. I used an uh, uh, Anki API uh, to, to synchronize a note with, an, with, a, with a deck of mine uh, made to uh, sites, uh, two directions synchronization. Um, and it kind of worked fine, so I used it uh, for my private cards. But at, at some point, I decided it's quite annoying to start this Java program every time. And uh, I'm using uh, Obsidian for my notes. And Obsidian allows you to make plugins. So I migrated this uh, Java uh, J JVM, Kotlin JVM uh, project, by the way, implemented with coroutines. Uh, into from uh, Kotlin JVM into uh, Kotlin JS, what turned out to be quite simple. Uh, and I um, published it as a uh, NPM uh, dependency. Um, and then I uh, implemented a plugin that uses this uh, NPM dependency. And um, I, I've been using this, um, this, uh, this uh, plugin on Obsidian to synchronize my 
my notes with my flashcards. What is what was a fun project, but I, I, I still haven't made it ready for others. I still am only using it by myself. So you said that uh, you like to uh, write books. What what books are you uh, coming up with next? Can you share? Oh yes, of course. I'm uh, currently working on a big series of books. So I uh, wanted to uh, I want to finally make it right to make the the series of of, of books teaching Kotlin that I dreamed about for a very uh, long time. Uh, so the first three books are based on my regular Kotlin workshop. So this is Kotlin for Developers Essentials. It is currently on a review and covers all the essential Kotlin topics. Then there is Functional Kotlin that was released um, recently, that has been released uh, recently, that covers all the functional features uh, of Kotlin, plus um, an Essentials of, of Arrow that was um, written by a guest authors, an amazing um, group of contributors uh, for Arrow. Uh, the next planned book of this series is Advanced Kotlin, uh, what, what goes way beyond the, the regular workshop, but over there I will explain the, the topics like annotation processing in Kotlin, like um, delegation in Kotlin, and also I will have some uh, guest authors who will describe some advanced um, topics like um, uh, Kotlin uh, JS, Kotlin native, and uh, uh, Kotlin compiler plugins. Those are topics I've used myself, but I'm not feeling strong enough to, to write about them. Um, and those three books will make a series of um, Kotlin for developers together with uh, effective Kotlin, with uh, uh, Kotlin Coroutines Deep Dive and Effective Kotlin. I want to make a, a, a big series of books. And the, um, the fun thing I'm working on is that I want their covers to make this, um, this nice shape. So you might know that each of my book is having this uh, regular shape. And each of those shapes will be moved a bit. So all those books together should, should make this one big shave on the shelf. It's extremely hard to make it right. And <clears throat> I need to finish. The, I need to feel that I have these books finished because the, the books in the middle will not be able to, to change their, <laughs> their length once I publish that. Uh, but uh, but I'm, I'm very excited about this project. Well, that's one motivation around uh, finishing the books. But uh, yeah, well, <laughs> good luck on that. Uh, we are yeah. out of time. Uh, it's been great having you, Marcin. Uh, so Thank thanks for coming on the show um, and, and thanks for all the work that you're doing in educating folks in the uh, Kotlin community, with the exception of that first book, which you yourself <laughs> said, I'm not very yeah. happy for, about. For, forget about Don't, this stop one, learning the, the next one. <laughs> the rest of the books are, are better. Thank you, Hadi. <laughs> Thank you, Sebastian. Yeah. Thank you for having me here. Take all care. Right. Cool. Take care. And everyone else, we're going to see you in a future episode. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, we forgot the sponsors this time. Oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, this, this episode was brought to you sponsor-free. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I don't know. That kind of there stuff. There you go. Excellent. Bye. Bye-bye.